Recently, I got my first taste of building a wearable, a dog collar light for my dog, Joey. It was a fun but surprisingly challenging project, and I ended up documenting that entire process in a separate video that you are very welcome to check out. In this video, I'll be diving deeper into the electronics of this project and some of the surprising problems that I had to solve in order to build a bright LED wearable with a 40 hour battery life that can also survive a dog. Let's start by recapping how the light works and the main components of it. The light consists of my own custom made PCB that sits inside a 3D printed case with Joey's name on it. It's lit up by two bright, beautiful Cree RGB LED lights that are controlled by an ATtiny84 microprocessor. Using a microprocessor was critical here in order to be able to make cool RGB LED light shows. Pressing the middle of the case activates a tactile switch, which in turn controls turning the light on and off, as well as switching between different modes. Power to the light comes from two CR2032 batteries connected in series and providing a theoretical 6 volts. Although actually they provide more like 4, and to find out why, keep watching because if you're building your own wearable with coin cell batteries, this is going to bite you too. Uploading new code, including new light shows, can easily be done thanks to these six through-hole pads. They provide a serial interface that can be connected to via pogo pins to an ISP programmer. Here's what these components look like in the KiCad schematic. You're free to download it in the description below in case you want to build your own dog collar light or just want to follow along better. And of course, while I've got you, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new projects that are coming out. Here's the basic wiring. The two coin cell batteries provide power to the microprocessor, which in turn directly powers the LEDs using resistors to limit the current. Pin 13 on the ATtiny connects to the switch to let us know when it's pressed. The 10K resistor keeps this pin pulled down to ground so that when the switch isn't being pressed, we don't have a floating pin. Some of these pins also connect to the ISP programming headers, which allow me to upload that new code. And lastly, we have pins 12 and 11 going to two transistors. I'll explain those in a second because that takes me to the first challenge that I ran into. Controlling the LEDs with the ATtiny. At this point, using a microcontroller in a project like this is pretty much a must. The programmability, tiny footprint, and low cost just make it a no-brainer. I chose the ATtiny84. It's not the latest or greatest, but it's super easy to program with the Arduino environment, and a lot of makers have used this processor as well. That makes it a lot easier to troubleshoot when you can just look up common problems online, such as getting sleep mode to actually work. This choice does have one glaring downside though. The ATtiny84 only has four PWM pins. Really, I needed six. PWM stands for pulse width modulation, and it's a very easy way to control the brightness of an LED. Instead of just being able to turn an LED on or off, PWM makes it possible to turn it on and off super rapidly, faster than the human eye can perceive, in order to give the appearance of the LED being a lot dimmer than it actually is. Since an RGB LED actually consists of three smaller LEDs inside it, a red, a green, and a blue, by controlling two of them, I effectively have to independently control six LEDs. And that means in an ideal world, I would have six PWM pins. My workaround to this was to have the same pin on the ATtiny control the same color on both of the lights. So one pin controls both the red LEDs, one pin controls both the green LEDs, and one pin controls both the blue LEDs. But wait a minute, you might say. What about the Christmas mode that you built in? It's got one side showing red and one side showing green. Yes, you're right, but notice that only one side is lit up at any given time. My sneaky workaround to this was to use these two transistors sitting in a transistor array to be able to turn an entire light on or off on each side. One transistor allows me to turn the left side off by completely preventing the three circuits there from completing, and the other transistor does the same for the right. So when I want to light up only one side of a light and not the other, I just use the ATtiny to control which transistor is allowed to complete a circuit and which one is not. This does use two more pins, but they don't have to be PWM enabled, and so it actually isn't a big deal. The ATtiny has plenty of those. By the way, here's what that transistor array actually looks like. 
I went a little bit overboard trying to save space and I ended up choosing a footprint that was way too small and a huge pain to solder. It was kind of a fun challenge, but I can't say I recommend it. Now let's talk about a problem that I hinted at at the beginning of this video. Powering those LEDs using coin cell batteries. I chose coin cell batteries for this project because they are very safe, which is important when they're strapped to my dog, and because they pack a surprising amount of power into a very tiny space. However, I discovered a very interesting problem. Here's my multimeter reading the voltage across two completely fresh batteries connected to the light. And here it is again with the light just turned on. Whoa, what's going on here? When I turn the light on, the voltage drops, and a lot. But when I turn it off, it starts to climb right back up again. When you try to draw too much current, the high internal resistance of a battery causes the voltage to drop. And the more you try to draw, the worse this drop gets. During my first prototype, this was a disaster. I was drawing about 30 milliamps, and in one particularly bad test, that led to only two hours of battery life before the voltage dropped below a useful level. The final optimized version of a light uses a much more reasonable three to five milliamps, but that's an average as measured by a multimeter. As the light is turning on and off rapidly, the actual current being drawn by the lights themselves is going to oscillate between zero when it's off to 10 or even 20 milliamps, depending on how many lights are switched on. So I had an idea using capacitors. When the PWM signal is in the off state, the capacitors are able to charge. When it's on, they're able to also provide power to the LED, lowering the current demands on the battery. The hope was to average out the current draw so that the peaks wouldn't be so sharp. In my breadboard experiments, this did seem to make a difference. Here's what the voltage looks like without the capacitors, and here's what it looks like with them. Notice that the max voltage drop isn't as steep, which ultimately means a longer useful battery life. I also found a white paper on the internet that supported this finding. I've linked to it in the description down below because it goes into this problem a lot deeper and it's quite interesting. Speaking of the problems of using coin cell batteries and voltage drops, let's talk about the voltage regulator that wasn't. When I was first designing the circuit, I assumed that I would have to provide the ATtiny with some sort of stable voltage such as 3.3 volts or even 5 volts. So when I was prototyping, that's exactly what I did. I had a 5 volt step up, step down switching regulator lying around, so that's what I used in that first circuit. In theory, it would take the 5 to 6 volts that the coin cell batteries were supposed to be outputting and step it down to a steady 5 volts. Well, when I actually hooked up this circuit to my coin cell batteries, the current draw shot up a lot way more so than when it was hooked up to my benchtop supply at 6 volts as well. This took a lot of troubleshooting to track down because my entire mental model of what was happening was wrong. I thought that I was taking about 6 volts and stepping it down to 5 volts. But of course, that's not what was happening. Remember that whole discussion about the coin cell batteries and that voltage drop? The coin cells were actually outputting more like 4 volts and then the voltage regulator was taking that voltage and stepping it back up to 5 volts. That itself was consuming more current and of course was completely wasteful. There's nothing in this circuit that actually needs 5 volts. The green and blue LEDs only need about 3.3 volts to operate, the red LEDs only about 2.1 volts and the ATtiny can go down to 1.8 volts. 5 volts is overkill, and of course, if we're working harder to step up back to 5 volts, all of that power is just being wasted as heat. Just terrible. In the process of trying to troubleshoot all of his power usage stuff, I ended up taking apart a commercial dog collar light to see what it is that they do to make their batteries last longer. I ended up noticing something very interesting. That light didn't seem to use a regulator at all. Monkey see, monkey do, so I decided to remove the regulator from my circuit as well and just see what happens. Surprisingly, the light still turned on and most importantly, the power usage did actually drop. The ATtiny appeared to be handling the fluctuations in voltage just fine, which I really didn't expect. I do have a bypass capacitor in my circuit, but that stores a very tiny charge, 
So the AT Tiny is constantly operating at different voltages. Okay, now hang on a minute. Just because you can get away with something doesn't mean that you should do it. You might be asking yourself, why didn't you use a 3.3 volt regulator instead? That would have been a pretty sane choice. Good question, internet person. That's still an experiment that I wouldn't mind trying, but to be honest, I kind of suspect that the result would be worse. Aside from the extra parts and complexity that this would add to the circuit, the other major issue is that any sane regulator choice I could make here would be a step down regulator only. And that means that as soon as the battery output drops to about 3.3 volts, the regulator can no longer function and the light is essentially out of battery. But remember that both the AT Tiny and the red LEDs can function well into the lower two volts. And that means that as long as you're willing to have the light output only red, that means that the light can still continue functioning beyond that. As Elon Musk likes to say, the best part is no part. And while I can't recommend this approach for every application, for a silly dog color light, it really does seem to work. Fixing the power draw issues in the hardware made a big difference, but there were still further optimizations to be made in the software itself. In the case of a dog collar light, the first optimization was building out light shows that look bright and awesome, but which don't actually use a lot of battery life. First off, the code never stays at a high brightness for very long. Instead, all of the effects fade or pulse through different brightness levels constantly. It's cool to look at, but it's also a major battery saving measure. The other really important optimization is implementing sleep mode well. The dog collar light is never truly off. When the user presses the button to turn it off, the code actually puts the AT Tiny to sleep instead. While it's asleep, the power use is extremely low. The concept is simple, but the AT Tiny has several sleep modes with different power consumptions and different rules about what works and how to wake the processor up. Additionally, we only want the light to truly turn on if the user presses the button three times, so there actually ended up being a lot of logic and troubleshooting to wake up on a button press, wait for two more, and then go back to sleep if that didn't happen. Speaking of having to turn the light on three times, let's talk about dog proofing the light. This meant using software hacks to deal with two specific issues that came up as a result of Joey jostling his light around. The first was Joey turning the light on or off accidentally when running around or playing with other dogs. I got around this problem by requiring those three quick presses to turn the light on, and then requiring one long press to turn it off. The other issue that I ran into was the light just randomly turning on and off while it was attached to Joey. I couldn't replicate this. When I would test it on my bench, I would run it for over 40 hours straight with no issues whatsoever. This was driving me nuts until I figured out that the problem was an ever so slightly loose connection between the battery and the battery holder. Sometimes he would jostle the light in just the right way that the battery would lose contact for just a fraction of a second and that was enough to lose power to the whole light and therefore turn it off. At this point I had already done a lot to try to hold those batteries in better, including adding this little spring clip in order to really press the battery against its holder. So finally I decided to use EEPROM to remember if the light was supposed to be on or off. When the AT Tiny starts up, it checks to see whether it was last on or off and automatically starts in that mode. It works really well since implementing this hack, the light has never turned off spontaneously. I'm really happy with how this project turned out. I feel that it's objectively better than most of the lights that you can buy at Amazon or at the pet store. That said, there's always room for improvement. The one big change that I would make if I had to build this project again was to just go ahead and use the newest AT Tiny series. It's more power efficient and it turns out the newer chips actually do have six PWM pins. That would have saved me some trouble. I got a little too conservative by going with the AT Tiny 84. The other experiment that I think would be interesting to try would be either to completely remove or massively lower the values on the resistors going to the LEDs with the hope that I can have less power lost on the resistors themselves. The LEDs can technically handle larger amounts of currents in short bursts, and of course by using PWM and very careful programming, I could probably make sure that I don't burn them out. Will this actually save power and work reliably? 
Who knows? But it's worth a try. Do you have any ideas for improvements? Feel free to post them in the comments down below. And of course, feel free to check out that build video that shows creating the dog collar light from start to finish. It's a little bit less technical and more just showcasing how fun the project was to make. Thanks for watching.